does intervene and ESCOM lets us get through this um, in a smooth manner. So I opened my talk by saying that uh, my task is to contextualize the Sachi chair's place in the African Academy, which I consider to be both a simple and a difficult task. And for me, the simple part is that majority, I am assuming, um, majority, I'm assuming that majority of the audience today is African and or feminist. Um, I'm told I'm, I've been made, um, just one second, I'll try. Um, I see a, a, a message on the chat saying I might be able to share my slides. So let's see. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So there's some hidden blessings to ESCOM's misadventures. So um, I was saying the simple, the simple part of my task for today is around contextualizing the, uh, the African and the feminist um, bit of our conversation today. But the difficult part is the imagination because in a world that privileges the STEM disciplines, the humanities is often treated like a stepchild in the knowledge production landscape. And to complicate matters, the genres of the imagination that is literature, visual arts, performance arts and other art forms are assumed to be transparent because they form part of our everyday life. And it's this misrecognition of imaginative work as both transparent and low value that I'd like to address today. So I'd like to start us off with this letter that was published in the Dear Sister Lee advice column of Drum Magazine in January 1965. And the letter reads, I'm a girl of 18 and madly in love with another girl of 18. I'm so fond of this, of, of and used to this girl that I have no interest in boys. My days never complete until I've seen and played with this girl. Dolly, I'm becoming very worried about this. How can I divert my love from her to boys? And the editors who were all men at the time responded, your use of the word quote unquote love to describe your relationship with this girl frightens me because it suggests that you're developing lesbian tendencies. Well, this is a most disastrous thing to happen. You need to see a psychiatrist and that immediately. So over a century, over half a century later on the 10th February, 2020, another young woman called the Metro FM radio show ask a man seeking advice on how to handle a cheating and emotionally manipulated girlfriend. The show is hosted by the radio personalities Dineo Ranaka, Lirato Kanyaho, Naked DJ, and Somizim Klongo. This young woman's call was treated with respect and empathy. She was given serious and thoughtful advice on how to handle the situation. And unfortunately, um, our audio refused to cooperate because I was going to play you a small clip of that um, call. But, the reason I'm sharing these two pieces is to ask what happened between 1965 and 2020 for perceptions of, sex, of queer love to shift from quote unquote, a disastrous psychiatric condition to a legitimate bond of love. And homophobia remains a crisis across the continent with every week bringing terrible news of another queer person murdered. But something has shifted. And I want to suggest that this shift is partly thanks to the South African constitution, which honors same-sex love. And also we, 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 we all know, of course, the role of um, South African feminists in ensuring that during the drafting of the constitution that it was very um, attentive to a range of questions, including gender and sexuality questions. But I want to suggest that this shift is also part, it is also, partly due to the imaginative work that's done by visual art, music, literature, and performance arts. And I'm thinking about this imaginative work through the lens of Barbara Boswell's concept of creative revisioning, which she explores in her, in her latest book and wrote my story anyway. And she describes creative revisioning as artists use of creative agency to analyze historically specific gendered experiences while imagining alternative forms of consciousness, counter narratives and boundaries of the possible. So my talk is titled Arts of the Possible and I borrowed this title from an essay collection by the feminist writer and scholar Adrian Rich. And I know this raises questions about the necessity of borrowing from a white American feminist when today's meeting alone is awash with with distinguished African feminist writers. 
I'll address this question later in my talk, but for now I'll say I chose to title my remarks Arts of the Possible, because to me that is what African feminist imagination stands for. And that's what we're here to celebrate, the possibilities that this platform opens up in knowledge production, network building, and communities invested in reframing registers of the human. So why does African feminist imagination matter enough to warrant a dedicated research, um, such a research chair? The terms African and feminist mark two positions that have historically been subject to the lie of marginality and inferiority. Africans and feminists are consistently told that our place is on the edge of whatever landscapes we find ourselves in, including in Africa itself. And we see through this lie that the lie is old and powerful enough to shape our access to resources, our legibility to the world, and our capacity to live out our full humanity. Yet these locations of false marginality have also been generated for us in the forms of literacies, creativity, and open-mindedness that we have been forced to master. So most of us will be familiar with this piece of wisdom that's regularly circulated on social media. But I think this comment goes beyond linguistic com competence to speak to those of us who find ourselves in spaces that do not speak our cultural, political, spiritual, and other vernaculars. Without romanticizing marginality, I have a deep appreciation for the gifts that come with living in a world that is not customized to your convenience, because it nurtures a spirit of curiosity and receptiveness to multiplicity. You have no option, you just have to develop those skills to survive literally. So because of this double marginality, African feminist frameworks are largely intersectional. And they cannot help but be attentive to the multiple identities, institutions, and lived experiences, and how these intersect, overlap, and sometimes compete with each other for control and resources. And that's what makes African feminist frameworks so generative. On the other hand, our third concept, imagination, spells subversion, transgression, creativity, and refusal of limitations. This is the terrain of possibility. But we also know the dangers of possibility for systems that are very invested in policing human potential. As Edward Said reminds us, stories are at the heart of what explorers and novelists say about the strange regions of the world. They also become the method colonized people use to assert their identity and the existence of their own history. So the power to narrate or to block other narratives from forming and emerging is very important to culture and imperialism. So what is evident from Sayed's observation is that imagination is not inherently positive. In fact, elsewhere, Chinua Achebe draws a distinction between the nourishing fictions of a healthy imagination and the brutal fictions of an evil imagination. The fictions of a healthy imagination give us what he calls a second handle on reality, allowing us to explore life's possibilities beyond our specific location. But we all know the fruits of wicked imaginations pretty intimately, because to varying degrees, we all victims or survivors of the tripartite alliance between white supremacy, patriarchy, and capital, with different levels of complicity on our part, admittedly. The most wicked part of these alliances, evil imagination, was its attempt to define the human as white, able-bodied, middle-class, heterosexual male, or what the Jamaican um, theorist Sylvia Winter terms the Western bourgeois ethnoclass man. Historically, the further one diverges from the supposed definition of the human, the more precarious one's life becomes. So according to Winter then, the problem of this millennium is a problem of the Western bourgeois ethnoclass man's overrepresentation to the exclusion of the majority of the human populace as well as the non-human environment. And again, um, she talks about the forms of overconsumption and, and, and pollution to the benefit of a minority at the cost of the majority of the dispossessed and the poor across the world. But our experience with this tripartite alliance teaches us that power is never maintained exclusively through the use of force. And this is why all iterations of white supremacy, patriarchy and capital seek to control our imagination. They recognize that violent force alone can only go so far, but to fully control a people, you need to capture their imagination. 
The examples of this policing of the imagination are countless. In our context, apartheid South Africa banned literature and films that imagined different lives for Black people. As we learn from Professor Kola's work on Miriam Clergy's life and work, which we'll hear about more, sh more about shortly. Elsewhere, the literary scholar Bhakti Shringapore writes about the, the, the Cold War period. And she writes that during this period, the US was not content to engineer coups, assassinations, and proxy wars in Africa. It had to supplement this military mischief with a cultural paradigm by secretly funding literary magazines, writers' collectives, and literary awards in an attempt to control global perceptions of the US, despite the forms of violence that the US was busy with across the world. More recently, we've witnessed how the Ugandan presidency of Yoweri Museveni criminalized the scholar and poet Stella Nyanzi's writing. Museveni, with all his power and might, felt threatened by a poem circulated on Facebook. So African feminist imagination then is about the possibilities that emerge when we take artistic modes of making sense of the world seriously. Here, the value of such imaginative epistemes lies in their power to analyze, diagnose, and synthesize ideas across different time frames. In the words of the, of the novelist and writer Ngogi Wationgo, Literature has often given us more and sharper insights into the moving spirits of an era than all the historical and political documents treating the same moment. The novel in particular is important in that respect. It pulls apart and puts together. It's both analytic and synthetic. So for me, Gugi's remarks resonate beyond the genre of the novel to include imaginative, other imaginative representations. And in similar vein, African feminist imaginative work invites us to look back at where we're coming from and to use the resources we have available to us to imagine livable futures, even if such imagining remains aspirational for now. I'll give two quick examples of how I see this playing out in, in, in feminist African feminist work. The first example is the case of the artist and scholar Shadin Khan. In her mixed medium art installation titled When the Moon Works is Red, the award-winning South African visual artist and scholar Shalin Khan explores the lives, loves, and hurts of three generations of South African Indian women caught between the jaws of the extractive British imperial project in Natal and the patriarchal narcissism of their men. In a world that apportions memory selectively, the stories of the women who accompanied indentured Indian laborers to the Natal sugar plantations stand little chance of emerging. And it's in this context then that Khan's work is a powerful subversion of the many silences that haunt tenderness. And the, full, uh, the work includes um, visual, um, large scale visual uh, uh, multimedia canvases as well as a video performance, which is available on the, the link I've, I've posted on the screen. And, and I'll post this thing, link as well on the chat platform at the end of the session. And it's also available in another, in another version in a book of the same title, When the Moon Works is Read, which includes essays by feminist writers responding to the work. So I'll really encourage you to look up the work because it's just rich and, and, and you know, provocative in terms of the kinds of conversations that it's convening. My second example is a short poem from the East African British poet, Watson Shire, and it's titled In Love and War. To my daughter, I will say, when the soldiers come, set yourself on fire. And it comes from the collection teaching my mother how to give birth. So that's the entire poem. And Shire compacts so much in these three lines that are deceptively simple. Powerful intertextual allusions to an entire library of historical and sociological truths, which we have become desensitized to. The weaponization of sexual violence in conflicts is so normalized that one of the most popular personalities on South African Twitter is a disgraced former SANDF soldier who was reportedly discharged in 2015 for sexual violence while serving as part of the, again, ironically, UN peacekeeping forces in the DRC. But this man retains such popularity and a huge following on Twitter today. So 
Shuri's poetry disrupts this kind of normalization of wartime rape, and it uses defamiliarization to revive our shock. The seemingly calm conversational tone of the poem throws the monstrosity of wartime rape in sharp relief. The speaker will encourage their daughter to self-immolate as an act of self-love because the alternative is monstrous. That we live in a world where this can be part of a cross-generational pedagogy of survival for women, even hypothetically, is a monstrosity that is eloquently captured through poetry. But back to the window I minimized at the beginning, how dare I center a white American feminist at this event? Am I being torn deaf to the decolonial moment? I don't think so. And I know I might be crucified for this, but I want to say that I'm invested in the promise of decolonial praxis, but I worry about the dangers of parochialism. This danger not only comes from shunning non-African bodies of knowledge, but it also extends to the blind spots that are created when we fetishize the novelty of our struggles and the supposed novelty, actually, one might say, not realizing that some of the wheels we are trying to invent have already been invented by our feminist foremothers and fellow travelers elsewhere. So we need to guard against presentism and the seductions of novelty, which sometimes come at the expense of erasure of prior work that forms the bedrock of our very existence. To me, decolonial praxis is not synonymous with parochial rejection of difference. It's possible to dismantle the hierarchies that continue to inferiorize African knowledges without rejecting so-called Northern or Eurocentric knowledge wholesale. And I'm emphasizing wholesale here. When we reject bodies of ideas based on who is producing them or where the location from where they are being produced, we sometimes end up disowning our own contributions to that body of knowledge. The literary scholar Tejumala Olanian reminds us that it's impossible to talk about the ideas at the core of the European Enlightenment, particularly its conceptualization of freedom, without acknowledging the impact of African presence in Europe at that time. And this is both directly in the sense of enslaved and other black presence, and indirectly in the role of black labor in building Europe's and America's wealth. Locally, we might say the same about our relationship to Africans, which again is another controversial terrain, but this is a language whose roots lie in the terms of enslaved African and Malay women before it got bleached into whiteness, as Habiba Baderun's work demonstrates. So as I mentioned earlier, African feminist imagination is necessarily capacious in its world making. It empowers us with the necessary literacies to recognize the workings of the tripartite alliance and its extractive logics across different geohistorical landscapes. So I'll give this example. These are the five books that I've read recently. The first four on, I don't know if it's your left or right of the screen, but the first four are novels, while the fifth is an essay collection on Black feminist experience in South Africa, edited by Desiree Lewis and Habiba Baderun, and featuring a whole range of um, just wonderful contributions from uh, Black feminists from across South Africa. So none of the four novels is African. In fact, they are respectively about a Scottish working class family, a Palestinian family, four American friends, and Korean experiences of Japanese colonialism in that order. But each one offers a recognizable portrait of how the tripartite alliance of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capital reinvents itself across time and space. For me, reading these novels at the same time as I was reading Surfacing, the novels ended up in a way uncannily mirroring the kinds of issues that were being raised by the feminist authors in the essay anthology despite cultural and geohistorical differences. And this is, what I'm, this is why I'm claiming Adrian Rich's title and thought for today's deliberations. In closing, and I know I've been talking long, so I'll, I'll wrap this up by saying that I'd like to invite us to ask ourselves, what are the urgent questions of our time which an African feminist imagination might help us to think through? And how can we respond to those questions in whatever small ways are available to us from our respective locations. And I'm aware of how overwhelming many of the questions that come to mind are, how paralyzing they can be. But also know that we're here today because many generations before us rejected paralysis. 
even when their dreams seem to be At some point in slaveocratic America, it was illegal for enslaved black people to learn to read and write. But they wrote their stories anyway, to borrow from Boswell's title, even though the people they wrote for and about could not read. And it would be a few generations before their work would have a huge black readership. So the question for me is, and this is the question I want to leave you with, is well, thank you very much for listening. Congratulations to the Nelson Mandela University, to Professor Kola, and to the entire African feminist community, both in South Africa and across the continent and beyond for the kind of work and the exciting possibilities that lie ahead with the Sachi Chair for African Feminist Imagination. Thank you. And we continue to write our story anyway. Professor Musila, thank you for leaving us with these questions. Thank you for asking. Thank you for conjuring the kinds of work that we all do. We will take these questions and we'll continue to ruminate through them. Let them percolate and let them create more work for us. If you've just joined us, we are launching the Nelson Mandela University DSI NRF Sachi in African Feminist Imagination. Imagination, Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Natalia Mulebadzi, for all your magical stewarding of us today and uh, for reminding us that um, no ESCOM formed against us um, shall prosper. I mean, I think that as a um, as, as, as African intellectuals and researchers, we're trying to change the world, but sometimes our governments <laughs> complicate our lives in these, in, these, in, these, in these ways. We appreciate you, Asanda Mkwiki, and your colleague, whose name I'm sorry, I've now forgotten. Um, thank you, VC Professor Mutwa. DVC, Dr. Mgwebi, Professor Kiet, DVC, um, Director of Research, Dr. Kwe Zimzilikazi, whom I've, there she is. <laughs> Dean of Humanities, Professor Masego, for your visionary leadership. and all of the hard work of making this chair possible. Because even though we make it look glamorous and easy and, 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 and so on, enormous amounts of work go, enorm colossal amounts of strategic, intellectual, and onerous work 
uh, make chairs and centers possible. At a time when women's studies is under strain across the country, across the continent, across the globe, where funding cuts are particularly brutal for social sciences and humanities work, for arts funding, it is no small matter to be homed by an institution actively resources as core project the revitalization of the humanities. Chancellor Geraldine Fraser Mulegedi, chairperson and all the members of the NMU Council, because my chair is indeed partly NMU um, Council funded, the NRF leadership, and especially the Saatchi team within, within, the, within the NRF, thank you. Wendy Adams has worked tirelessly to make sure the many moving parts required to ensure the launch today goes smoothly. I'm grateful for the leadership of my immediate director, also um, Dr. Baba Lama Kotwana, and um, um, acknowledge all my colleagues from the Center for Women and Gender Studies, Bonzo Mabena. As always, we appreciate all the work you do on the digital front, even when ESCOM tries to, suggest, to, to sabotage you. I think we at the chair and the Center for Women and Gender Studies have now decided you no longer only belong to the IT component, but we are giving you honorary CWGS membership. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be joined by colleagues and students from the CWGS and chair, Dr. Tleng Wendlovu, Virat Shubasad, Asipem Kalisa, Yandisa Jubase, Vyoka Zikwam, Spoka Zitau, Apu and Tlemeza, and Buitube Lomambane. I can't thank my birth and chosen family enough for their support and love. I acknowledge all my colleagues, comrades, sisters, all my friends joining us virtually, and I'm delighted that my wonderful son, Yetu, is physically here to share in the joyful discovery and marking of this moment with me. <laughs> if I named all the people who are in the room virtually and physically who have helped me get here through their own scholarship, and an intellectual generosity, their collegiality, my students from different universities over the last 26 years. Dr. Mkwebi, <laughs> not very young. <laughs> over the last 26 years of teaching at South African universities. Um, and of course, the writers, the dancers, the visual artists, musicians, whose generative genius has inspired my work and this chair, we would be here for a week, just listing names and works. Feminist artist Kolega Putuma, in her poems, and Kharnita Mohammed in her novel, Call to Song, have shown us that to list names that create the world, that create our African feminist worlds, is more than roll call. It is more than protocol. It is ground clearing, acknowledgement of energy, of time and work, that it is song and incantation. My sisters in the African Feminist Forum and African Feminist Movement inside and outside the academy who are here with me virtually, I may not be physically in purple and green today, but I always am. The Saatchi Chair in African Feminist Imagination enters the luminary tradition that Professor Grace Musila has evoked and traced for us this afternoon. Although to be African feminist today is to constantly dodge accusations of newness, we work in a long tradition of scholarship, artistry, movement building, many generations deep. By now, there are long established traditions of African feminist scholarship and contestation in African universities and the academy across the globe. The accusation of newness and or, or invisibility are not real ignorance, although they may also partly be evidence among some of our colleagues of mediocrity from those of us who accuse of doing no work. For how can we take seriously the expertise of scholars who claim seniority in their disciplines and particular fields in African studies and elsewhere, but no knowledge of African feminist scholarship within these very same disciplines and areas of locations they claim. 
when my graduate students can locate the scholarship in a quick Google search. One of the very basic requirements of scholarship, in addition to curiosity, is the capacity and the ability and the willingness to read the field. It is not lack of knowledge, but willful ignorance. In other words, deliberate investment in patriarchal erasure. It is the same insistence we saw previously within histories of political scientific work that wrote of pre-colonial, anti-colonial, and early independent movements as though there were no women at all erasing the very women that such scholars, writers, organized alongside of, relied on for comradeship, intellectual activist, and other forms of support to the trivializable roles. Not trivial, but the trivializable roles of girlfriends, wives, mothers, or marginalia. The absence of a sense of irony here in this masculinist tradition is dazzling for generations of left African male scholars and activists to inscribe women through colonially derived evaluationary logics of political, creative, and social roles as purely bodily and sexual is striking. The willful ignorance is as evident in attempts to exile African feminists from continental liberatory, creative, and scholarly traditions and archives as they are part of the undoing of feminist work in the world. The source, their sources are multiple, not just the patriarchal African scholarly tradition I've just mentioned. I will spend merely another two minutes pointing to them here in order to dispense with them and get on with the business of what this chair seeks to do. To do I mention them only because it is important for us as African feminists to be clear that we see, to be clear in our articulation that we see what this claimed ignorance really is. That we see it for what it really is. Willful ignorance of African feminist archives or the refusal to read or engage the work of African feminists or to read African feminist work only in relation to gender and women and not on the universes of ideas and work on which feminists have produced insight and theory and work. The constant claim that haunts us, that we hear constantly, that is often emailed to us, nobody has done work on X. When excellent undergraduates can locate the volumes that exist on that very area. The trivialization through last minute consideration or random instruction to any feminist thinker on a specialist area outside of their expertise because feminist work is not seen as serious intellectual work. So as I often joke with my colleagues in the Center of Women and Gender Studies, sometimes I get asked to speak about women and dams. Now, I don't know anything about dams. <laughs> <laughs> or women and architecture, and I think, we are the feminist architects and geographers and engineers to tell you um, about, about this area. But this kind of notion, of course, that gets banded about that, we need a gender specialist. And it's not a real specialization because any gender specialist can speak on anything. It is the willful ignorance of women's movements and institutional building energies and framing feminist intellectual en um, energies as merely responses after the fact, rather than reflecting on feminist roles in the origin stories of certain movements. Willful ignorance hides in the concerted efforts also to criminalize, and thank you, Professor Grace Musila, for how you started your talk, because this makes um, this argument even easier. The willful ignorance hides in the concerted efforts to criminalize sexual and reproductive choice to police women's freedom of movement, to limit freedom of association and rights to inheritance in various Southern African countries, sponsored parliamentary bills against gay men and lesbians in different countries on the continent, like Uganda and Nigeria, seek to criminalize same-sex desire, gender, fluid identification, as well as the expressions of solidarity. And in the devastating clampdown that we're currently witnessing again, on queer folk, this time in Ghana, as I speak. 
Most recently in Egypt, Zambia, Kenya established feminist vocabularies and strategies have additionally come under increasing criminalization and civil litigation. As, El as, as, as Mona El Tahawi and Wambun Wangi remind us, we would do well to remember reminders by several African feminists on how to read these instances of willful ignorance. Siham Samai, African feminist strategic litigator and leader, reminds us that such attempts to muffle and disguise are not only about demonizing feminist solidarity, they are also about maliciously obscuring and interrupting the project of feminist jurisprudence. Jessica Horn insists, again, that the rise of right-wing sexual and gender texts sponsored from elsewhere is religious fundamentalism. Yes, articulated through spaces we recognize as religious, but Horn also teaches us to read these efforts even when they do not occupy explicit spaces explicitly defined as religious, to read these efforts as more, much more than the continuing legacy of colonial patriarchal violent inscription, which they also are, but also through the lens of how ideas, including these murderous um, sexual, these murderous texts on, on, on sexuality, through the lens of how ideas become institutionalized as religion. This is what she means when she invites us to think about conservative um, sexual texts, right-wing sexual and gender texts arising and being sponsored on our continent as religion. A while ago, Tenju M. Tinzo invited us to ask this question. If African feminist work is so invisible, so ineffectual, so inconsequential, why is it that the backlash is so strong? The backlash in the rising brazenness of violence against women and queer people of all genders. The organized misogynist, heteronormative sponsorship of right-wing sexual religion that Horn writes about. The reinscription of colonial patriarchal police, policing texts. The onslaught on bodies in what Grace Musilla has just called the tri, that was just has just called the tripartite alliance, and that Egyptian feminist Mona Al Tahawi calls pi, patriarchy's trifecta of locales in street, state, and home. Why is the backlash so strong if our work is so weak and ineffectual and invisible? The onslaught on African feminist articulation and organizing sits oddly against an apparent explosion that we see globally in self-identification as feminist. I'm 48, and so I'm constantly struck by how even 20 years ago, those of us who um, proudly identified as feminists seem to be few and far between. And it seems these days with some joy, but also with some wonder um, that, you know, I cannot get away from other feminists. I'm not trying to get away from other feminists, but I am amazed by how fashionable feminist identification has been. The onslaught of African feminist articulation organizing sits oddly alongside the apparent explosion in feminist self-identification and global popular and celebrity culture over the last decade. And the resurgence of highly visible women's marches across African and global cities. Such popularization has brought into tension the radical critique offered by intersectional feminist movements, cultural production and scholarship on the one hand, and the free-floating celebrity feminism that returns to previously problematized notion of essential women on the other hand. Within the African content, contexts, feminist thinking within and outside the academy has surfaced the heterogeneity in feminist expression. This stands in sharp contrast to popular celebrity feminisms whose shorthands erase the multiple locations and histories of feminism and centers the North American, Western European bizarre framework of feminist histories as fitting tidily and exclusively into first, second, and third waves within which African feminist and other femi post-colonial um, and anti-colonial feminis feminisms are always then designated to third wave 
and here two newly arrived. Patricia McFadden argues that African feminists who participate in the crafting of radical knowledge are confronted with the consequence of inequality in ways that are either deepening and expanding with such rapidity that our abilities to respond in credible and sustainable ways have come under severe pressure. She goes on to argue for the importance of developing new lenses, of continuing to develop new lenses, strategies, and ways of engaging patriarchy in necessarily multiply situated and interdisciplinary feminist introspection and renewal. Epistemically, the African Fem Imagination Chair shares curiosity with other feminist projects about social justice, gender and sexualities, performances of identities and meanings that emerge from their study. The location of the chair within the humanities rather than the social sciences and specifically within the study of creative genres, literature, film, fine arts, music, theater, visual, performative and popular culture demands, recognizes that such study demands particular methodological consideration to access very specific nodes of knowledge generation and realms of possibility. The recent inclusion of creative outputs for subsidy as knowledge production by the National Department of Education, Science and Technology is one acknowledgement of this. This humanity's focus means that while in conversation with thematically and theoretically allied scholarship in different um, disciplinary clusters, the African Feminist Imagination Cluster unapologetically centers the disciplines of literary theory, art criticism, art history, film criticism, all of which share an orientation about the creation and working of language and rhetoric communication distinct from disciplines concerned with the direct study of society. Second, this chair deliberately troubles borders of nationality and roots within African feminist epistemic traditions informed by the theoretical and methodological insights of African feminist literary scholarship. Epistemically, I think those of us located in the South African Academy, geographically and epistemically, have serious work to do in terms of our relationship with the area we call African studies. Epistemically, after the UCT Mamdani affair and its current institutional revisiting, what does it mean to disavow the legacy of academic projects located in Southern Africa, in South Africa, that claim African studies while remaining unabashedly South African-centric, with a little bit of Lesotho, a little bit of Eswatini, maybe one module on Mozambique, mm, increasing bits and pieces on, 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 on Zimbabwe and, 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 and no Namibia, never mind um, further north. The chair's partial response to Mamdani's challenge, which is still important because so little has changed structurally since that intervention, is to invest in an investigative project with multiple migratory centers. As West Indian feminist theorist Carol Boyce Davis might say, Boyce Davis conceives of what she calls migratory subjectivities to write about multiply located African continental and diasporic feminist theorization in black women's 20th and 21st century writing traditions. Her framework developed over several book projects and journal artic articles that culminate in her book, Black Women Writing, Ident Writing and Identity, Migrations of the Subject, um, is central to my own work here. Like her, I am invested in simultaneously drawing from the wealth of existing African feminist methodological clusters and to contributing in the proliferation of African feminist academic vocabularies. Third, the chain African feminist imagination addresses that accusation on which I started, the accusation to African feminist work of newness and or, or illegitimacy by turning to African feminist archives and memory. This refers to revisiting existing African feminist archival project 
sustained attention to African feminist biography and mapping directions in African feminist imaginative praxis. The African Feminist Creating Archive includes strategies of African feminist activist praxis on which much non-academic writing already exists. Extensive historic contestations on the relationships between activism, movements, and imagination, as well as long-standing traditions of writing African feminist pasts. By African feminist biography, I invoke both biographical or autobiographical projects of individuals or movements in different um, and the varied, and the varied in different movements, my apologies, and the varied past or ongoing work on the African Feminist um, Forum in both its continental and smaller local structures. Mapping directions in African feminist praxis delves into the realm of academic projects in the idiom of two of the Tanzanian feminist theorist Susan Andrade's projects. The one, literary genealogies, and the other, writing or rioting um, women. And I'm struck often by how her second theorization of reading, the insistence on reading writing women as rioting women, um, receives incredible circulation in the post-fallist South African Academy without any reference or anchoring, um, or indeed naming of Andrade as part of the history of, of, this, of this particular formulation. And so um, it is fascinating to me that, that, that often, even as people are deploying a key African feminist conceptual term and framework, they are also arguing about the absence and the ignorance of African feminist theorization. And so, and, and Andrade's one is simply one example. I won't um, bore you with, with listing several others that circulate constantly. And I'm sitting there going, what, what do you mean you don't know African feminists, but you just, okay. The first of Andrade's idioms, what she calls African feminist literary genealogies, enables the reading of creative projects of multi-generational writers as more than intertextuality linked. In Andrade's earlier work, she writes of this through Florence Nwaba and Bucci Emecheta's novels as African feminist conceptual battles with mothering and motherhood. In her later work, Andrade asks what it might mean to think of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie to be working as one who works in the tradition, not just of the often invoked Achebe, but even more so as a literary descendant of Tsitsi Tangaremga. In academic traditions, we understand that knowledge generation is enabled by previous ground broken, thematically, theoretically, and methodologically. Andrade shows how the same can apply to successive generations of African feminist writers. Taking Andrade seriously requires reading this text, these texts or sites together in ways that complicate both conventional scholarly pathways of generation or geographical organization and thematic exploration. These conventional scholarly forms of analysis obscure the intricate development of an idea or of an African feminist strand on subjectivity or girl subjectivity, specifically in this example, from Dangaremga to Adichie in ways distinct from the many ways in which we theorize um, or think about childhood elsewhere. In the second of, of um, Andrade's idiom, the one that's very popular, she requires not only writing women as writing, uh, rioting women and rioting women as writing women. In the second of Andrade's idioms, she requires not only the shift to think of African feminist linkages across geography and class and theorization as that which exists both on the page and can be theorized through performances of the body and, 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 and other ter ter territorial imagination, in seeing writing women as rioting women and vice versa, but the continued generation of methodological tools that trouble these categories. But even as I hold on to Andrade's insistence 
and, and celebration of generational, um, of, of, ge of, of geolo genealogies, I hate this word, genealogies. At the same time, as Keguro Macharia's work stretches us, we need to interrogate the taken for granted metaphors and conceptual vocabularies of kinship that are so beloved of African and African diasporic scholarship. Macharia insists that we need to think ourselves out of what Macharia calls the genealogical imperative and the ways in which it too, in its stress and unquestioned stress on celebration of kinship, and the ways in which it too, despite some of our best intention, relies on logics of on heteronormative reproductivity in calling up family as primary site of intimacy, connection, and community. Against Macharia's lesson then, what might it mean to extend this rich conceptual language of frottage to study forms of interaction, of fiction and friction, sensual and indeed sensuous, which is very distinct from sensual as African feminist essayist Mina Salami's invitation stresses in her critical new book, Sensuous Knowledge, Black Feminist Knowledges for Everybody. Although some interdisciplinary work exists that reads across the boundaries of genre and citation practices defy boundaries of creative genre scholarship, much African feminist scholars of literature, performance culture, and visual art predominantly work within the confines of our individual disciplines. In other words, while all of us, I'm putting myself in this up until the moment of the chair, um, <laughs> right? So we train, part of, part of our training is to work ma masterfully within our own disciplines, right? To read literary activity occurring at the same time as musical activity as though they are universes apart. While these scholars, these scholars including me, read and cite other scholars of creative genres from their own and comparative contexts, we seldom simultaneously place different genres or creative texts from different language traditions under sustained scrutiny. This remains true in the very presence of productive, sustained engagements um, with difference in other ways, within the social sciences, for example, within African feminism. Over the last three decades, examples of this commitment to interrogating difference include scholarship reflecting on disagreements, such as several iconic, marked often through reference to several iconic um, African feminist um, moments. The 1991 Women and Gender Conference in, South Af in Southern Africa held at um, what was then the University of Natal, some of which were published in a special issue of current writing on African feminism, as well as um, Damon's edited collections that came out in South Africa in 96 and um, elsewhere in 2015. The 1992 Women in Africa and African Diaspora Conference at the University of Nzuka, whose contestational nuances are collected and analyzed in Obioma Naimega's um, tome, multiple special issues of the African Feminist um, Journal Agenda or Feminist Africa, and, and, and so on. Although there is much cross-breeding at the level of theoretical and conceptual vocabulary, there is a hesitance there is paucity of material that simultaneously works across creative genre and or, or language in a sustained manner. This is a striking aversion, given that art historians, musicologists, film and literary scholars are all trained within disciplines that assume that the context of cultural production work through modes of what Raymond Williams has elsewhere called structures of feeling. In other words, the preoccupations and or anxieties of a time are likely to find expression in creative activist and cultural production of people working in very different registers. Against this backdrop then, it makes sense to assume 
that produced under similar conditions, context, geographical, conceptual, and otherwise, plays, music, novels, and films produced in the same place would share preoccupations and or influences that would therefore benefit from comparative analysis across genre. Similarly, given claims to a migratory political and aesthetic commitment, often characterized also as pan-Africanist, African feminist scholarship should transgress inherited colonial and disciplinary language barriers as frequently as activist activity does. This is the task of this chair. I seek with the team to advance knowledge by interrogating trans-historical articulations of African feminist radical knowledge in creative genres juxtaposed with a comparative analysis of emerging traveling strategies of feminist imaginative intervention. Breaking with African feminist convention within the humanities, the chair attempts to read African feminist articulation across the boundaries of creative genres, historic language tradition, and performance cultures. Towards these ends, we are concerned with how we can think across the disciplines in African gender scholarship, but also reflect critically on the constitution of the field through scholarship, through discipline, through national boundaries and or epistemic traditions that we inherit from divisions such as Saharan, Anglo, Luso, Francophone. The migratory orientation that Carol Boyce Davis names um, will seek to question these inherited regimes of difference while probing the very meanings attached to such structures of difference. We're interested in this chair in what it means to speak about African feminist intellectual and creative traditions and vocabularies, those African feminist vocabularies that, 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 that my, um, It's very difficult when your VC uses the word favorite because whatever else you say, um, <laughs> as, 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 to claim them, whatever is actually written in, in, in front of you kind of uh, pales by, 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 <laughs> by comparison. Those African feminist vocabularies that we invoke, that we refer to, are there ways in which beyond rhetoric it means something material and epistemically relevant to think, to think of reading texts through other, creative texts through other texts beyond simply bringing them into conversation. What kinds of contributions move from women's intellectual activist creative organizing into more accepted narratives? I've referred to Andrade in this example, while losing memory of the source as they do so. What does it mean then to reintroduce this memory of this occluded sources to the larger epistemic projects? We also want to know how African feminist creative and intellectual workers have developed theories for understanding immediate and comparative contexts. Desiree Lewis has for two decades insisted that literary, that, African fem that certain African feminist literary texts theorize what does it mean to take this seriously beyond statement? How do they theorize? How do they theorize similarly or differently to other places where we assume theory resides? And what is the materiality of such theorization? How do we make sense of emerging feminist discourses on sexualities and pleasure? Not simply the policing, concretizing sponsorship of violent regimes. Indeed, if it is true that literature, and I can, I'll say literature, sometimes I'll say art, but I will, um, I mean all the creative arts, because I don't want to say if literature and art and music and dance and Popular and, and, and. If, if it is indeed true that literature can embrace any number of contradictions, then any study does fiction no service by concentrating solely on the issue of politics as ideology, as is often the case in readings of, of, of powerful, transformative creative texts 
um, in popular parlance, in popular readings, often um, the, the mere assertion or identification or validation of a, of a painting as concerned with political concerns often means that what makes the, art, the language, the constitution of the work as art is, 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 is in fact um, ignored. If indeed it is true that literature can embrace any number of contradictions, then any study does fiction no service by concentrating solely on the issue of politics and ideology on the presence, ending up reducing the fictional to politics by dismissing the equally necessary question of literary value, literary technique, um, and the work at hand. It may be that the work does not welcome scrutiny. It may very well flout the expectations of aesthetics as well as those of literary critical reading or art historical reading and evaluation. That in and as of itself does not alter the fact that it has been conceived, written, and published as a work of art performed as a piece of music or dance. Jay Pathas reminder that the value of art is not only as witness to or engagement with conflict, pleasure, possibility is important. It's a multidisciplinary approach characterizes an artistic consciousness that is rest restlessly in search of ways to remain, to remain at something, to, to, to irritate something that remains elusive, not just elusive. Because artists have long been telling us that in Partha's words again, once stable systems and institutions, master narratives, unquestioned forms of memorialization and government development plans no longer account for who and what we are. In what ways do works of the imagination intervene, engage, trouble these forms of knowledge? Yeah. Nilika Jawadan, in similar vein to Partha, writes that art can not only reveal problematic structures, but it can also offer dangerous possibilities. Again, linking back to Musila's um, warning that imag not to romanticize imagination, that imagination can do disruptive work both in ways that expand freedom but also in ways that concretize um, freedom, I mean unfreedom. All her dangerous possibilities through which seemingly impenetrable power structures may also be troubled or made por porous. It allows us to sit and make sense of what Penisiopis calls her preoccupation with the poetics of vulnerability. In her presentation, Grace Musilla elegantly traced the ways in which power recognizes the value of the imagination. Postcolonial literary scholars have long reminded us that it was not just the gun and the Bible, but also English literature that were crucial to how British colonialism took root across the world. And perhaps those of us who are trained traditionally in English departments, who are also African feminists like myself, like Grace Musila, like Barbara Boswell, have an even bigger responsibility to undo some of the harm that comes from, from, our, from, our, from our discipline. It is not accidental that tyrannical governments kill painters and filmmakers, torture writers, imprison musicians and demonize dancers. Such rulers recognize the power of creative registers to creatively revision in Barbara Boswell's theorization and to also create possibilities in the worlds beyond their making. So for Boswell, to subtitle her book, her latest book, Black Women's Novels, as feminism, not and feminism, is deliberate languaging. It fleshes out what it means to speak of creative genres as theorizing, not as transparent, easy, or sites for mere application for pre-existing theory, but as sites themselves that theorize and create in very specific um, ways. I am convinced that, as with its allied disciplines at the heart of this chair in the study of the creative arts, Feminist literary criticism is a source of pleasure, of stimulation, of confirmation, of insight, of self-affirmation, of doubt, of questioning and reappraisal. 
It has the potential to alter the ways we see ourselves, others, and to alter the world. Indeed, I'm grateful to Grace Musila for the reminder of the urgency of resisting and indeed working against parochialism. Our knowledge of the world as African feminists, as Habiba Baderun often reminds us, is not only valuable because meanings leak, but also because of another reminder, um, also in Bami, so, 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 so the reminder of, of a leaking of meanings exists in Baderun's mostly creative work. In her scholarship, she reminds us of something different. That to be African feminist is also always to be a knowledge maker who speaks not only about African concerns and contexts, but who also speaks about the world. And so part of the work of this chair is also, of course, in the recognition and the implication of, uh, implication of the ways in which to theorize in African feminist ways is not simply to theorize for Africa, it's, it's to theorize and to center African contexts, but it is also to theorize the world. Thank you. Joanna Pumla, journey woman of limitless skies and roots. What are your foundations? We too are searching for our foundations. We are searching for formulation and formation. So when you traveler, warrior, rioting, writing women of all feminized people of all genders and no genders, when you get to the other side of remembering, tell them that we were made of flesh and the blues and the magic, 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 the magic. Tell them that we are this way of being, bold and beautiful, bold and beautiful. Tell them that we were woven into long tapestries of knowing that holds us up when we cannot uphold ourselves. Tell them that we were made of flesh and love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pumla Kola, Professor Pumla Kola, for the kind of imagination that you are setting us into. We're going to shift gears now and change into a traveling of another kind. I'm going to invite Professor Gola as well as Professor Barbara Bob Boswell to a conversation of Miriam Gladi writing freedom. As they get ready, I must, and will, I want to do this for Miriam Tladi, for Barbara, for Pumla. You are a song singing in the deepest voice of my people, a lullaby cusping tears, an amandla song to every child of the storm. Someone said, that you are the wind beneath the broken wing of my people. Another one said that women like you are the mending season of our aching. Women like you give and give and give their last breath to ignite fires called revolution. 
even when they force feed you the rules of silence. You, Miriam, fought for your story to be told in the season of your voice. And inside your body reside the melodies of our people. You with an uncontainable wail that grew larger and louder than any tight grip of oppression. With words that force open the doors of a world that was never, that will never be ready for our kind. You, Miriam, who will navigate us on a moon of secret conversations and moments of endearment, the same moon that will welcome you and we on an orbit of black magic woman wonderment. You who loves the world more than she loves you, you who gives dreams and gifts to our bag of memory, the same gifts that we craft songs for tomorrow's healing. And between COVID and ESCOM, or should I say ESCOM, I am now going to take the pleasure and the honor of inviting Professor Gola and Professor Boswell to take us on this journey of this very necessary book, Miriam Tladi, Writing Freedom. Make we understand how Miriam Tladi remains in our conjuring, in our dreaming, in our making of memory. Please help me welcome Professor Kola and Professor Boswell. Thank you, Natalia. And thank you, um, Professor Gola, for that brilliant, brilliant um, presentation and work on feminist, black feminist imagination. I am so um, thrilled to be here and very delighted to be able to honor you on this occasion. Congratulations on your installation as the Sati Chair for Black Feminist Imagination. Um, greetings to all our sisters and colleagues and comrades who are attending. Um, thank you again for this wonderful occasion and thank you for the work that you do. I'll jump right in with the discussion. I have prepared a few questions on Miriam Sladi writing of freedom. Um, it is such an auspicious event to be launching this book at the moment when you are also taking up this position, this chair. And I wanted to start by asking you if you could delineate the relationship between feminist Im imagination and the work of Miriam Tladi, which you so um, eloquently summarize and bring into focus in this particular book. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Professor Boswell. It's so good, it's so good to see you. Um, and thank you for your work. I mean, I think that um, the, 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 you know, the work that I, and certainly thank you so much for all of your work on, 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 on Miriam Tladi and on, and on African feminism. Oh, no, can't you can't hear me. I'm oh, sure um, okay, we're gonna, I don't know. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. Oh, for goodness sake, I'm so sorry. I mean, it's right here, it says mute, but I don't know where I think I'm being, I, I, I think now I think, I think now I think I'm some kind of, um, now the host has muted me. Okay, I'm so confused. Okay, I'm just going to speak and hope that, um, all right. I'm very confused and I'm starting to think, forget that I'm a professor and starting to think I'm some kind of person with a camera crew. <laughs> I don't know where to look. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara Boswell. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Professor Boswell. For, and, and of course, when I think about, I mean, it's very hard for me to think about 
my work on Miriam Tlaidi without always being in conversation with, with the work that you have done on, on, on Miriam Tlaidi. Um, which, 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 is, which, which, which so enables mine and which is so much in conversation with, um, with, 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 with yours. So it's, 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 it's absolutely wonderful to be um, having this conversation with you. And of course, as I was writing, as I was writing Miriam Tlaidi, writing Freedom, I was, I was reading your new book um, and wrote my story anyway, Black Women's Novel, Black, Black Women, South African Black Women Novelists as Feminism, as well as your other work, on 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 on, on Tlaidi. So so in many ways, um, beyond just kind of mutual recognition, um, your work has been quite important in 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 my capacity to fine tune and distill what I think is 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 is, is, is Tlaidi's role in how we think about how we think about um, Black feminist work, how we think about African feminist. Um, intellectual and creative and creative um, activity. And I think in terms of Tlaidi, um, it is both, just to, to answer your question directly now, it is both, I think, the specific modes in which she writes, in which she creates something um, beyond the page, on the page, but also something that generates beyond the page. I'm thinking, for example, of the ways in which you write about how Tlaidi's um, Tladi kind of imagines space and remakes space in, 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 how, in how she crafts um, characters. But I think also in terms of her position, in, in terms of her position as a, as a pioneering um, feminist um, writer, in her position as someone who was both a literary activist and someone who also enabled um, the expansion of, 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 of other writers' work. So I'm thinking um, Tladi's, Tladi's role in the kind of African feminist imaginative project is both what she puts on the page, but also the literary institutions that she builds. So for example, her co-founding of Stuff Rider magazine, which, which of course is, is, is the most, you know, is, is, is such a productive and significant space for black writing um, and the upper date, which everybody writes about, but you know, some of that invisible work, of course, of co-founding and, 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 and doing that work. So I suppose the short answer is that I imagine a positioning in, 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 in a dual way, in both the work that she does on the page and how she represents and creates specific um, possibilities in what you call creative revisioning, but also the work that she does off the page that is about shaping um, spaces of the imagination. Um, I suppose the word that, that, that is used often now, and the art historians and fine artists will, will, will forgive me, but in curating spaces of the imagination for others as well, so not just her own writing. Mm, thank you. I'm very interested in the connection between writing history and visibility or invisibility, which you have brought together these disparate strands in Pladi's writing. You say that she was a writer very conscious of history and the invisibilizing of women's writing, black women's writing, and her own work as well. And you refer to this also in your text when you talk about Staff Rider and how when you were starting your research and doing your research in the 90s and beyond, there was quite a substantive body of work on Staff Rider, but that seems to have disappeared. And somehow you position Tladi as writing against these kinds of disappearances through her preoccupation with history and her understanding of history. Can you expand a little bit more on this idea of Tladi and her engagement with history through her fiction and other writing, please. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that we come across often um, when we talk about tradition or when we think about kind of, you know, um, the, 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 uh, when we think about what it means to enter a, a tradition as a, as, a, as, a, as a writer, as a scholar, is, is that part of writing into a tradition is the capacity to assume, to take certain things for granted. The capacity to assume that other people, to know that other people who are similar um, have come before you, which then is an enabling um, mnemonic. It's not just mnemonic, but it's an enabling um, um, position. 
part of what I, in, 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 in Gladys' case, of course, there, there is this duality because on the one hand, um, when we see in some of her, in some of her nonfiction, so for example, in the, in, in the, in the essay that I include from her interview with Lillian Ngoi two weeks before her death, she speaks about her awareness of all of these questioning, creative, provocative, transgressive um, women in public spaces, imaginatively, politically, and, 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 and so on. So clearly an awareness of herself as entering a certain tradition. Yet at the same time, in relation to her writing, she often says in those interviews that you also work with that are that are part some of some I think one or two of which are included in 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 in, in, in my book. Um, she often speaks about how she has she, she she didn't even though she was a she was a serious reader even though her paternal family on the Lesotho side owned a publisher. That and even though she was highly literate. And, and, and read fiction, she had never read a black woman, that she had never, um, she had no awareness of, black, of a black woman's writing tradition. And so she, so, 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 so the capacity to imagine herself as a writer was almost counterintuitive. And what's interesting to me, of course, is that Clyde, um, as you and I know, is, 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 is much older than, 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 than you, and, uh, you or I. Yet when I read your PhD and when I read and wrote my story anyway, I am reminded of the sense um, when I read your encounter with Head um, as a young journalist in Cape Town um, and reading for the first time the imagination of a black woman writing about your home city and, 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 and beginning to imagine the possibility of yourself as a writer in very different kinds of ways. And so, um, and so and so and so I think that this 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 is part of what allows me to think about both Clydes and perhaps just as many of us as African feminist um, knowledge makers, especially in the in the in the creative um, traditions um, and in and, and in the disciplines that study these, the sense of a shifting sense of his of location and historicization. We work very often, we're all trained in the, human, in the conventional sense of humanities and social sciences to think about um, the long durée of history as though once something is done here, it can be taken for granted as achieved. And yet in fact, an examination of the work, the imaginative work of, of African women in the world is an encounter with the constant explosion and disappearance. So it doesn't matter that you were, so for example, um, even in, in, in kind of contemporary South Africa, people speak often, people not recognize the name Miriam Tladi at the same time that her books are not available, right? So the name can be visible without the work being visible. Um, Miriam Tladi can become the first and Bessie Head become, can become the first, but people who are 30, 40 years younger than them can encounter them for the, encounter the sense of being without a tradition again and again and again. And so it seems to me that an invitation in Tladis, like in your, in, 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 how you, in, how you, in how you write about your discovery of Head, whom technically you should have known, you were a writer, right? You were literate, you were degreed, you were trained in these traditions that Head also works in, and yet, the existence of, 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 of this work, of her work, of this black woman writer before you could still both exist and be, inv and, and be invisible. And I think that's a very kind of complicated relationship with history and creativity and the imagination that is perhaps not exclusive, but is definitely peculiar to, to, to the relationships between, between, between feminist imagination and black women or African women in our, in our context, and one that, that, that certainly Tladi's work um, puts in quite sharp focus. I don't know if I've answered you, but I think I have. You certainly <laughs> have, thank you. <laughs> I think um, I want to get to something that you mentioned, Tladi as a first, now in this book, you are you go to great lengths to um, deconstruct this notion of the idea of the first, the first black woman this, the first black woman that, and you say that to celebrate Slidy as the first 
African or black woman in South Africa to publish a novel in English is actually a kind of violence. You write that Charlie's entry into the first status was hardly a story of triumph. So firstly, it was um, through a lot of difficulty for her that she achieved this goal, but also that it is um, invisibilizing and erasing the very thing we were just talking about, right? The whole tradition that comes before her. Can you expand a little bit more on this danger of celebrating uncritically first? Yes, certainly. I mean, I think that I think the first problem is 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 that um, when you say when we say we we need to problematize the allocation of first status, it seems as though we're saying something quite malicious. It seems as though we're taking away from the work that someone has done to break through something. This is not quite what I think that I'm gesturing at. I think I'm gesturing at something that another African feminist in the, in the art historical tradition, um, uh, Nondombe Gondombela, talks kind of the fractured archive um, when she writes about a woman similarly located to Tladi and head in our discipline, but in her discipline, Mkungunzov. Um, Mkuzanzu, um, uh, sorry. Kuzanzu is Peter Marinsburg. Um, um, Kuzanzu, the work of, 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 of the artist Kuzanzu was the first black woman to be exhibited in a, in a, in a, in a gallery in, in, in South Africa. And her both, the, the hyper visibility and the, and the, and the, and the capacity to, 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 to disappear. I think the problem with this allocation of first status is that it, it renders celebration hyper visible. But it's, we, we, but, but we, we are so drawn into the work of celebrating and recognition that we take our eye off what else this firstness illustrates, which is why it is that this is the first, right? And of course, in order to be first, yes, of course, you're exceptional, but it is not only that you're exceptional, it is also to be the first of your kind is also testimony to the enormous amount of violence that has stopped many more from occupying that position. And so I think it behoves us to be careful in our celebration, not in the celebration of the achievement of this wonderful person um, and this gift, but to also simultaneously Think about what it means that this firstness is only occurring now, that there is a firstness, that this is not a taken for granted. And of course, also certain categories of, of, of intellectuals and, 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 and creatives are constantly being the first again and again and again and again, as I, and, as, as I think, as I think we, we, we are showing. So when Tladi, um, publishes for, for the first time, she's unaware of Head. And of course, then there is, Head is the first black woman to write a novelist. Tladi is, the, in English, Tladi is the first black woman to write a novelist in English, inside the country. And, <laughs> you know, and it just goes on, and then somebody else is the first, you know. And of course, as Omar Bacha also invites us, when we think about Head and Tladi as the first black women, we're also doing very interesting work about who can or cannot be black because he suggests that there may have been other texts that actually were first before these two, but um, I, I have not been able to find some of those. Um, so that's the one thing. And then the second thing, of course, is around the difficult, and once we think about the violence that makes this firstness only occur now, that delays this firstness, that delays this moment of eruption, we also have to pay attention to what that violence looks like, what it inscribes, what it does, what it, how, it, how it shapes that versus. And in Tladi's case, of course, the novel, the form of the novel that marks her as first is a novel she hates that pains her her whole life. Because it, in fact, is not the novel she wrote. Right? And for many years, and this, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be very short for the, um, but you know this, Barbara. Um, so for many years, when we read Mural at Metropolitan, um, and we, then we read other books by, 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 by Tladi, um, we, I was certainly, as a young literary scholar, struck by how sparse and quick 
the way Mural at Metropolitan was written versus her layered, textured, complicated rendering of black interiority and black women's lives in her subsequent texts. And I simply decided, well, it was the first. Maybe she developed this capacity for, for reimagination and texture later on. And although I had read the interviews, although I read the interviews in my honors year and my master's year and so on, over and over again, where she speaks about how angry, how pained she was by Murad Metropolitan, by how it was such a thin um, book, by how it was not her book, by how she only allowed Raven to publish it because her mother was dying and her mother eventually said, how about Wanaga? I'm going to die before this novel comes out. And even though she hated the novel because she felt that they had done a hatchet job on a novel, I didn't, it didn't really compute. It is only later on, post apartheid when I read the international version between two worlds that carries the name she gave to a novel and that I realized something more to what she had said. For, but in fact, even after that, it is only honestly in the writing of this book Miriam Tladi writing Freedom, where I sat with the two texts and sometimes read the same two chapters and realized that the difference between these two chapters was night and day. That contrary to the popularly accepted um, assertion by Raven Publishers, which is a left, very radically left, um, um, a publishing outfit in South Africa that was constantly banned and censored and so on. The contrary to what Raven Press um, people claimed well into the early 2000s, the difference between Between Two Worlds and Mural Metropolitan is not an issue of editing. Mural Metropolitan is a third of Between Two Worlds. And what is omitted most significantly is the voice of the narrator, of the focalizer, who is um, Muriel, uh, the, 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 the black woman character through whose eyes we interpret this world of Johannesburg in the late 70s and the 80s. Um, it is, in fact, reading between two worlds reads very much like her other works that I thought had developed in, 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 a, later, in a later idiom. And so, with all of this information, I then was particular, oh, part of what, oh, okay, I'm taking too long. Um, what was dr this, I, this, this dangers then of, of, of this marking and this celebration, this rush to celebrate her as first in the production of Mural Metropolitan was driven home even more. Because as I do in the excerpt in the book, um, Miriam Tadi writing Freedom, as I show, in fact, I highlight the difference. Um, and in just two chapters, there is almost 5,000 words of text, sometimes entire pages, um, usually entire reflections and commentary um, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the protagonist taken out as, 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 as unnecessary. Um, so I think, and, and I think that that speaks to, that speaks to uh, perhaps that, 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 that then just kind of makes me even more weary of this notion of this kind of blind celebration of, 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 of firstness. Thank you. Um, I, I want to talk now about Kunamid Luria. I was very excited to see this play included in Mariam Chladi writing Freedom. And I want you to, I know the story, <laughs> you've told it to me, but please can you tell it again about how you found this play? Um, and then I want to ask you also to comment on the significance of this play as we read it today from this vantage point um, almost three decades or more um, into democracy. Sure. Um, sure. Um, sure. So, um, Miriam, like, you know, Barbara and, um, and I are the same generation, but even when we're reading the work of previous scholars on Miriam, like, they, they, she keeps talking about, and then she wrote these plays. And where are these plays? She wrote these plays, one was performed in America somewhere, in Iowa, and one was performed in Holland somewhere, but nobody can find these plays. She doesn't publish these plays. I start to think these plays are a phantom. Um, we look for these plays, we look for these plays, even in our conversations with Miriam Tladi before she dies, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of kind of reference to work that she still has that's not published, but not so much to these plays. So, um, so most of us just, 
assume that the plays have disappeared. And then one day, I'm minding my own business, walking around Joburg, talking, spending way too much time talking about writing a book on Miriam Tladi that takes way too long. So, I mean, it, it, there's a lesson there in not talking about what you're writing. Um, and someone comes up to me. I've, I'm, I've, I, I'm at the State Theatre in Pretoria. Somebody comes up to me and says to me, who works at the State Theatre, and says to me, are you, are you the person who's writing a book on Miriam Tladi? I say, yes. He says, I have her play. I'm gonna get it to you. Are you at Vets? Yes, I'm at Vets. I worked at Vets then. And somehow this play finds its way to me. And it's, and it's a copy of the typed, um, not the computer type, like typewriter typed um, script with notes and comments and kind of things on the, on the, on the. So this person who I am mortally embarrassed, because um, I don't remember who it was. Um, I don't remember who this person was who, who, who ensured that this incredibly important piece of literature reached me. So it arrives one day, and then I call Barbara, because Barbara is, is the most prolific scholar on Miriam Gladys' work. I call Barbara and I say, have you seen criminal in, 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 have you ever seen criminal injuria? Do you know that it exists? I just found it, it really does exist, because I had been convinced, and I was trying to convince Barbara for 10 years that it, it doesn't really exist. And she made it up, it's a game that she's playing, just like you know, Ngugi once took out an entire rape scene from one novel and then republished it. So I thought, okay, it's been made up. Um, nonetheless, um, and so that really is the story. So I read this, so, so we read the play, and the play is, Miriam Glider in many of her interviews, keeps talking about how angry she is. So scholars say to her, well, there is a bit of anger. Is, is there anger? She says, I'm all anger. There's a lot of anger. But she writes kind of these beautiful, ripped, textured um, um, novels and, 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 and short stories. And I think in Crimean Injuria, this is where there is the most unhindered um, expression of feminist anger. It's a play about, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to render it very crudely because summaries often do this. Um, it's a play about how a woman, a domestic worker's daughter, kills the son of the, the employer's son, who had been her playmate, had gone to the army, and had come back and raped her. So the entire play is staged in the courtroom where um, where, 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 where the, the, kills the son and then kills herself. And so, um, and so the entire, the entire, oh, oh, then dies. And then, so the entire, no, I'm sorry. I, Barbara, what is the story about? I think I've got, I think I've got the wrong killer. <laughs> it is the mother, it is the domestic worker who kills the rapist of her daughter, my apologies. Um, it is not that the, 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 survive, the, the, the daughter who doesn't survive that kills, right? And so then the mother, who's the domestic worker, who's framed in all of the, who otherwise would be framed in all of those ways in which we see um, the rendering of the figure of the domestic worker in the South African imaginary as safe and reliable and, 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 and all of these things, she is on trial. And so she is the, she is the, so in, in, in some ways, I suppose we can read it now, reading it in 2021, as part of the tradition of kind of revenge um, fiction. But I think given the timing of its writing, we have to, we have to think about it as something that hmm, um, perhaps inaugurates a certain, a certain tradition. I don't know, Barbara, what do you think about the play? You've read it almost as many times um, as I have. <laughs> I, I have about... Um seven minutes left so i get load shedded over here so i'm going to just wrap up with my final question you're not um, going to tell me what you think I, about I'm the play i'm excited to write about the play because i think it um you know there are echoes with norbert's work in and they didn't die where the rapist um or would be rapist also is killed in the the last scene um so i think there's something interesting happening um that one can trace through and through other stories as well um, by black women writers. Um, but, but my last question to you will be um, about this fractured or scattered archive that you refer to, uh, you've just referred to it, but also in the book. 
Um, and we know from speaking to Chladi and from various interviews that there's also a novel um, that is missing that was stolen. You reference this novel in your book. Um, and this archive um, is scattered. It's all over. The, the crimin injuria came to you in a specific way. Um, what are the implications, you think? You, you say this is her whole body of work is not really knowable because we don't even know what's lost. Um, what do you think this archive may look like in 10 or 20 years as it becomes reconstituted? I have no doubt that more works will be coming out. We know that she buried her manuscripts in her backyard. Um, and, and how do you think scholarship on Tladi will unfold and take us into the future? Um, I think that, um, I'm not sure I'm able to answer the first part of the question. I mean, I'm hoping, um, I can speak about what I'm hoping it'll look like in, in 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I'm hoping that there will be even more kind of eliminatory ways of reading the work that we, that we have, now that we have um, more and more pieces from the scattered archive. But I think the lesson that I draw from, from um, non dobe con dombe last theorization of the of the of the of the of the of the scattered archive in the case of Mkudlandlu of um, Gladys Mkudlandlu is is in fact that um, we may have to always make do with the Scott scattered archive right that the archive um, I mean, archives, by their very by their very definition, make claims to completeness which they cannot actually deliver on. I think that there will be, I'm hoping, through the work, through your work, through my work, through a new generation of, of literary scholars that are reading Tladi and, and publishing on Tladi again, um, to be able to have an ever proliferating um, uh, uh, way of reading Tladi and of thinking about her and of thinking about her in relation to a variety of other kind of feminist black theorizations of blackness, theorizations of feminism. That, um, so I'm hoping for a, for a, for a generative proliferating um, um, archive, much more so than a, than, a, than, a, than a properly constituted archive. I, I think that I'm not just going to postpone that wish. I think I'm going to surrender that wish altogether. Um, we may never have all of her work, and I'm not sure if, we if, if, if in fact we recovered all of her work, we would know that we recovered all of all of all of her work. So I think the, the, the condition of the scattered archive is 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 both a frustration, but I think it's also um, we need to think about it as 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 infinite postponement rather than as a problem that we can resolve. Um, yes, I think that's all I have to say on that. So you're really not gonna tell me what you think about the play? You're going to make me wait until this article that you write on the play. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Professor Gola. Congratulations once again, and congratulations also to Nelson Mandela University on establishing this wonderful chair. And um, I am so excited and look forward to the work that I know, the generative and beautiful work that will come out of your space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, Professor Barbara Boswell, for having this conversation with me and your scintillating work. Thank you. And thank you, colleagues. Can I go? against all odds that you have given us. We really appreciate this work and we'll continue to engage with this work. As we come to the end of our program, I just, before we go to the vote of thanks, I just want to remind you and to be reminded that there will be a pantheon of deities guiding your path with the fiercest of light. And behind you will be warriors, rioters and writers on your front lines. 
an entire tribe of women who will remind you that we never walk alone, never cry alone, never dance alone. These are the ones who will remind you, who will remind we that our lives are worth defending, that our names are worth a dance, a chance, a choice, a dance, a chance, a choice, and a constant change that we never walk alone, never dance alone, never cry alone. So thank you for reminding us that joy and courage and transgression are surviving and thriving in our existence. Dear colleagues and friends, managers, writers, rioters, Please help me welcome Professor Andre Kiet, DVC of Engagement and Transformation at Nelson Mandela University for the vote of thanks. That's uh, brilliant, uh, Natalia. Thanks so much for that. And of course, both the discussions and, and uh, talk, uh, uh, Pumla, fantastic stuff. So good afternoon, uh, everyone, friends and friends. Uh, allow me to share a vote of thanks at the Sterling 2-in-1 occasion. Thanks to those who already acknowledged. And to this uh, list, I would like to add Prof. Tenjiwe Miiwa from uh, UNISA and Prof. Shereen Asim, as well, of, as well as representatives of the NRF. I wish to join Vice-Chancellor in congratulating Prof. Gola on